we have gathered to worship you in purpose and with purpose and intentionality. Lord God, I pray that tonight we would receive the worship of your children, the exaltation and the adoration of your babies. Lord, we just want to tell you that uh, we, we have the best father in the world. So Lord God, I pray that tonight you would move among us, move among those who are watching us online, the Lord, those who will be watching us at a later time. Uh, Father, I pray that your voice will be the voice they hear. I pray that it will be your truth that is received and that it is your life-changing message that is set. Lord, we love you and we lift your name on high for you are good all the time and all the time you are good. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus.
lyrics to that song are absolutely profound when you think about it. The king of the universe, the creator of all things, knows my name, knows your name, knows each of our names. And that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight, this devotion, is having a true relationship, not just with somebody who's our Lord and Savior, but somebody who is all in all in everything, the creator of the entire universe, the king of the cosmos. We can know him personally. In fact, that is the entire essence of everything about our relationship because it is truly a relationship and not a religion. Man's vain attempt at trying to establish that relationship is religion and it's, it's painful but it's, well, it's worthless actually. But a true relationship with the creator of the universe, it's a simple song and yet that is one of the most profound things that we say if you think about it. It's either true or it's not true, folks. And most of us in here, I'd say all of us in here tonight, I'd say everyone listening has staked their lives on the fact that you can truly know the creator of the universe. Pastor Mike gave me the opportunity to share this tonight, to share the devotion on Wednesday. And as always, when I have an opportunity to do this, I want to say thank you very much to the pastor and the deacons of the church, the authorities, for giving me the opportunity to do so. There is this little bitty... Bywater, Podunk, Jerkwater little town called West Bayan. It's about an hour and a half, two hours south of here where I grew up. It's about five miles north of my hometown of Cyprus. And West Bayan, it's really not significant for anything. I think it has a population of five people and 16 dogs. But I haven't been home in a long time. But it has a little four-way there. And right at the corner of this four-way, it's actually a, a major artery, if you will, of roads in that area between Anna and Bayan. Cyprus and going on up to Gordon and on to Marion. The traffic that comes through there on a daily basis, you wouldn't believe it. It's just, oh, it's a lot. And the thing about this little four-way is it's completely insignificant for most things, but in my walk with the Lord, I have had probably five or six really intense encounters with the Lord right there at this stupid little four-way. Why? I have no clue. And I'm not saying it's the only place. I mean, you can have encounters with the Lord virtually anywhere on earth. I've heard people sharing stories that they've had encounters with the Lord in the bathroom, you know, in the shower. Had amazing just experiences of His presence and His personality. But this little four-way, and I wouldn't want to bore you to death with, I could probably talk about this four-way for an hour straight and not even scratch the surface on the profound things that has happened to me in my relationship with the Lord here. But one of the first, very early on in my walk, I gave my heart to the Lord on August 3rd of 1988. And I would say before the year of 1988 was out is when this happened. Is right there at that four-way, it occurred to me for the first time that I could, after I gave my heart to the Lord, that I could think about God. And they might be thinking, well, yeah, okay, that's kind of obvious, Chris. But it never really dawned on me until that point that I could spend my time and it wouldn't be wasted in any capacity to think of the Lord of all the things that I would commit my mind to or to, pay, or to put my attention on, that that was the most worthy. A.W. Tozer, one of the great philosophers of the church, said there is no higher thought in the mind of man than the thought of God. And... This little devotion I put together is based upon that right there, the relationship and the thoughts of God. The, there is no higher thought of God and being with God, being a part of a relationship with Him, walking with Him. And then it occurred to me, how do you really know someone? You know a person by the amount of time that you spend with them, and especially alone, where you get comfortable and just listening to what they have to say. I would say that, you know, I'm no marriage counselor by no means, but I'm sure Pastor Mike would agree with me that he spends a lot of time in counseling of marriages where one of the biggest problems is he just doesn't listen to me. He just does not listen to me. I think, what, a couple years ago, he did the blue glasses, pink glasses, met the pat, or the series. It was profound stuff. But he just doesn't listen to me. We can get caught up in the mechanics or the religious aspects of our walk with the Lord, the day-to-day -day serving, the activities, and we can lose sight of the fact that it is a relationship, and we need to keep our mind and our heart centered on those simple facts. We need to spend more quality time just seeking after Him, just being at His side. And if I could, I want to share like 
three passages of scripture real quick. I'm going to do it right up front in case, well, you know, if I were to lose my place in my notes, I think it's much more intensely important that you hear what the Lord would have to say in his word than what anything I can share. The first one, and this I put this together from my quiet time in the last week and a half. And I knew that when I got on this one verse, it just it just impacted me that, and I didn't know at the time that Mike was going to ask me to share. And when he did, it's like as soon as he did, which a lot of times on Wednesday nights we kind of center on, you know, the gung ho Bible prophecy stuff. And to me, that's like the bread and butter of, you know, walking with the Lord. I, I so much wanted to to get into that and do something about that, but I know the Holy Spirit told me to stick with this. Psalm 99.5, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. A lot of times we can get caught up in a very man-centered faith, a very man-centered gospel. Let me explain. We can get caught up with our side of it and, like I said, serving and our own desires, our own wants, our own hurts, our own hopes, our own concerns and worry. And really, and we have to do those things. We, we need to serve. We need to work. We need to occupy until the Lord returns, of course. But in the process, we don't want to lose sight that it's much more important that it's a relationship with Him. It's a walk with Him. You can't be in a relationship with the Lord and not serve Him. Not a, a, not a good one that's growing, one that's flowing and moving onward. You, you can't be in a relationship and not have Him play, place in your heart to want to serve in some capacity and work. But to worship at his footstool, simply just to be in his presence. The next passage of scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they were traveling along, he, Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? All the serving? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her. Okay, I cut the rest of that off. But the Lord said to her, basically, sorry, I'm sure you have it on the screen. Martha, there's so many things going on that only really, so many are really important. And Mary has chosen the better part. And it's not going to be taken away from her. Mary chose just to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to his word. Now, we have to be mindful of the fact that we can't just lay around and do nothing. We're to be stewards. The Bible encourages that. But like I said, in, in knowing the Lord personally, you can't know him and not want to serve him. There's times of serving, but a lot of times our servitude, a lot of times our work in the Lord can be the biggest distraction of what is most important, and that's just true ministry to him. Just to sit at his feet and listen to his word, to share with it, to listen to what he would say. And certainly as he commands us to do what he commands us to do. If he puts it on our heart, we know, we truly know when he's put it on our heart to do something. In fact, a lot of times one of the big problems in the walk with the Lord is we look for excuses not to do what he's told us to do. And not to keep bringing Pastor Mike's name up, but again, I love to hear Mike preach. I'm not just saying that. And I think that all of us would agree, or we should agree. We are blessed by the level of teaching and preaching that we have in this church. But when I first came here, he preached a message in which he shared two points about that. There's two big lies that we try to sow. Lord, this is so true. The first one is you have to do something for your salvation. And once you get past that and you understand there's nothing that you can do and you just accept Jesus in your heart, then the next thing is, the big lie that he tries to tell you, is you don't have to do anything at all. Yeah, you have to serve, you have to work, you have to do what he's put on your heart. And he's given everybody talents and abilities for those purposes, for the greater work in the church, for the greater encouragement of our brothers and sisters to build up the church, to fortify it. But it starts in our personal connection with him, our personal relationship with him. And we get so lost in that. In fact, when we talk about serving, true followers of Jesus should be disciples just on, in the same mindset that the original 12 that followed him on the earth were disciples. And I have this verse in Mark 3.14 that just always, every time I come across it when I'm reading, it just resounds in my heart and my mind. And it says this, and he appointed the 12. Now it goes on to say that he did so he could send them out to preach. But before that it says this, and he appointed 12 so that they would be with him 
That was, that was the important thing. That was the priority. So that they would be with them. And then as they learned, as they grew, as they knew more about the Lord's character, as they knew more about his mission, about his word, then they could be sent out into all the world to preach. But it started with the relationship aspects to grow. Jesus modeled this all the time. He was, you know, there were probably hundreds of people at different times that followed him around. Some that left when they didn't like what he had to say. There were 12 main people that followed him around continuously. But even of that 12, there were three that would go off with him alone on a regular basis to pray and to seek. And, and there was always relationship. In fact, there's very few times other than when, the times when the Lord would get alone with the Father and pray and to seek him where the disciples weren't with him. But that was the thing. They were there to be with him and then to be in the act of serving as they needed. So a couple of points on this. Sometimes we can have a very skewed view of our, of our look towards God or how we see the Lord. We have three enemies in our walk. We have the devil, of course. Yes, he's absolutely real. He's out there. He hates your guts with a passion. He can't do anything to God the Father, but, you know, it's like somebody, I heard this, Petra. If you remember the rock band Petra years ago, saw a concert, and they shared this, that, you know, your girlfriend breaks up with you and you can't stand her anymore and you can't really do anything to her, or you shouldn't anyways, but you got her picture and you can rip it up and burn it and throw darts at it, everything else. It's kind of like that. We're created in the image of the Lord. Satan so can't really do anything to God the Father, but he can really mess with the image of him sometimes. But we also have two other enemies, the world system and then our own wicked flesh. And sometimes our enemies can create this skewered view of the Lord and we, we can get modeled down on that. We get We can get caught up in it to where we can't really see the truth or we don't choose to see the truth. But really, the one I wanted to bring out in this is the fact that a lot of us have it in the back of our mind when we, we make time to spend with the Lord, when we get along with Him, when we're reading the Word, when we're seeking Him in prayer, as we almost have half of this thought that, oh no, He's waiting in the prayer closet with a ball back because I haven't been in there in a long time. He's waiting just to pass, where have you been? And, I believe that's an absolute skewed view of the one. I could be wrong. I don't necessarily have a thus saith the Lord, but there are there's a, several passages of Scripture that illustrate this. I don't believe that's God's intention at all. I believe he's waiting in the prayer closet for us to meet with him, and he said, I haven't seen you in so long. It's so awesome you're here. God, I, only, I only have like 10 minutes. I remember what Pastor Dale, Dale shared this a lot. You know, Lord, I only have like 10 minutes. And the Lord's like, 10 minutes? 10 whole minutes? Can I have all 10 of them? Well, will I get to have all 10 of them that you spend with me? That's just awesome. And I think that that's more along the line of God's desire to spend time with us more so than the mean God the Father waiting with the ball back. Now, don't get me wrong. He is a God that is to be revered and to be feared. But in that fear is a fear of respect and reverence. He is a friend that will stick closer than a brother. Uh, the best friend anybody could ever have, but he's nobody's buddy. He is still Almighty God, and we, we need to approach him with that respect. We can't take it for granted. That, I've shared this before, but years ago I saw in a magazine several actors, prominent people, and I don't want to judge them, but based upon their lives and me, there's no way that it could be really... Again, not to judge them, but there's no way these people could be living in a flowing, growing relationship with the Lord. But they were all wearing t-shirts that basically said, Jesus is my homeboy. And I, I kind of appreciate in one sense what they were trying to say. Anybody can have a relationship with the Lord. Anybody, absolutely. But I think that they went about it very flippantly. And I think that their lifestyle really didn't reflect the fact that they were really believing that, if you will. Mary chose the better part, to sit at the Lord's feet and to listen to his word. Now, we can also look at this, that sometimes us as Christians, we get to the point where we think the only thing we're supposed to be doing is spending time with the word. I remember early on in my walk, when I was working, I'd want to have a Bible with me. And I got convicted of this by the Lord, that, that basically he was saying, Chris, don't be using me to justify you not doing your job. You're getting paid, you need to be doing this. When it's time to work, you work. When it's time to set my feet and listen to the word, then you set my feet and listen to my word. But don't use the idea of wanting to get in my word as an excuse not to be doing what you're supposed to be doing at the time. I think that's important to bring out in it. 
Second point, God is well worth and worthy of the time that we can spend alone with Him. He's well worth our attention. Of a verse from Daniel 9 3, where Daniel talks about him seeking the Lord, and he gave his attention to the Lord. A lot of times, our devotion, we can be praying, we can be reading the Word, and the whole time we're thinking about, oh, I can't wait for the next episode of Lion King. I'm sorry, it's not Lion King, Tiger King. I, got, I can't wait for the next episode of The Walking Dead, or I, I've got to get this thing done at work, or I've got to get this thing done on my assignments for school and get turned on the computer, or my mom's going to get all over me. There's all sorts of things that we can be distracted by, and we need to stop and put our attention onto the Lord. He's well worth it, and we need to develop a discipline. And it comes with practice. It's like anything. You don't pick up a basketball and start being Michael Jordan and be impossible. You have to start with basic fundamental steps and practice and working with it. And we have to quiet our minds and our hearts and start with the small fundamental disciplines of just quieting our heart and mind and paying our attention to the Lord. Because he is certainly worthy and deserving of our time and praise. And when it comes to thinking or meditating, a lot of times we as Christians, we want to steer away from a word like meditating because it gets crossed up with ideas of Eastern religion, Hinduism, and things like that. But really, meditation, deep dwelling of the mind on a subject, that's very much a Christian thing that we need to be doing. It's letting our mind dwell on the Lord. Letting our mind dwell on good things. There's a really good set of guidelines in the work. And one of those is found in Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Some translations say, think on these things. The word dwell means the same thing. Let your mind, pay your attention to these things. When we look at words in there, true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, any excellence and anything worthy of praise. If the Lord Jesus doesn't meet the description of all those words and phrases, then there's nothing in the universe that really truly does. He is the greatest thing that is true. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I think you could do a whole entire message out of Philippians 4 8 where you take each one of these words and phrases and you show the relevance in the word where all these things are just truly descriptions of the Lord Jesus. He is true, the way, the truth, and the life. He is honorable. There's nothing, there's no one more honorable than the Lord. True honor. He's right. He is pure. We only know purity as humans based upon what we can see of the Lord and the Word. Based upon what we can experience of the Holy Spirit coming into our heart and regenerating our spirit. He is lovely. There is no one more lovely. The lily of the valley, the brightest of 10,000, of good repute. There's an entire world that seems like in this day and age it tries to do things to the reputation of the Lord. I love the History Channel. I'm a history buff. And when I have, we don't really have it anymore. We just you know, have streaming services and like that. But when I had the History Channel, I could probably watch it all day long. But I got in a serious habit that any time they started talking about Jesus or the Bible, I just changed it. Because you're always going to have somebody that has a, a really skewed view of the Lord. And what sometimes what they're sharing has nothing to do with true evidence or, you know, even reality. It's, it's basically their skewed opinion of things. And it's off. He is of the greatest reputation of anyone ever. No, he's the greatest hero that ever lived. Nobody has ever done an act of selflessness or of higher nobility than what the Lord did in emptying himself. We just celebrated this weekend. And when you talk about what he did for us, and just, I don't even think it can be estimated in human calculation. If there's anything of excellence, there's nothing more. If there's no one more excellent than the Lord Jesus Christ, and anything worthy of praise. He is certainly worthy of praise. We can let our mind dwell on him because he is all these things and he meets all those descriptions. We're in the middle of this COVID-19 uh, quarantine, of course, and I would not want to make light of that. It's, it's a very serious thing. And I tell you what, in my mind, the novelty has really worn off when I'm going on pushing a month and a half without getting a fresh haircut. I'm telling you, I, can, I have the capacity, my wife will tell you, I have the capacity of being very vain about my hair or can. As far as physical attributes, it's, it's, 
It's the only one I think I have going for me, really. Well, boys, I have great hair. And I'm about to turn 50 years old here very soon, and you can't tell it by my hair. I don't think you can. Either. The beard, yeah, but not, definitely not the hair on my head. I am serious about my hair, but when it starts getting this long, and where I can't just comb it and go, like from some water run, comb it and go, I tell you, it grieves me. It absolutely grieves me. That's one of those thorns on my side right now, I can tell you. And as soon as we get into an operation with my barbers back in visit, in fact, I've thought about seeking through the church to see if there's anybody that has any kind of skill of cutting hair and see if they'd be willing, you know, to uh, let me give them a couple of bucks to fix this mess. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. But the novelty is more and off when I can't get a haircut. But during this time, I think there are some things that we could use this time for considerably more constructive in our walk with the Lord. If it persists, and it seems to me that I've been hearing and reading the news that Illinois seems like we're peaking on it now, and I certainly hope that that is the case. But in the time that we have remaining with it, let's make a commitment to spend at least some of that time every day when we get alone with the Lord and just say, Lord, you're worthy, to put our attention on Him, to say, to let our minds dwell on Him, to think about His Word, to think about the wonderful aspects of His character. And there couldn't be a more ideal situation for that than now. And I know there are essential workers. I have a job that's been labeled as essential and I have to show up. But there's plenty that, that don't right now. Spend some time with the Lord. Use it. And I know you might be saying, well, Chris, the kids are at home all that long. Well, outstanding. Encourage them to do it too. This is something we try to do in our house, that we try to encourage the boys to get along with them. You want to play the Xbox? That's fine. I don't have a problem. Go blow up all the aliens you can. In fact, if we don't blow up enough of them, they might invade. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful with that. And of course, I'm just joking. But at the same time, Victor, before you get on that Xbox and play for 16 hours, why don't you spend about 15 minutes along with the Lord just thinking about Him? Just putting your mind on Him. So you can encourage your children to do that. And I was thinking I was putting this together. There's no way that I can be the only one that said what I'm about to say or has said it. But I think it's very true. And I think that the more that it, this sort of thing would be said, just the repetition of it would confirm the truth of it. There is never, never has been any such thing as social distancing from the Lord. We shouldn't be. I mean, now that's one thing as Christians, we get a lot more practicing than we have any business doing. You know, for whatever reason, you know, Lord, there's, I've got this going on. I've got to go, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I've got to get this lesson together for Sunday. Or Lord, I'm a deacon. I've got to get the stuff together for communion tonight. There's always something. We have excuses. We have reasons. And I'm not trying to make light of those excuses or reasons because those are the bounds of our service. However, if it's getting in the way of our true ministry to the Lord where we're just sitting at his feet and listening to his word, then we need to reevaluate that. But in the process of social distancing ourselves from one another, let's make sure that we don't do any distancing from the Lord. What Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection, he did to close the distance between ourselves and the Lord. An eternal distance, a void that can never be a gulf, that could not be crossed, that could not be surpassed, and he did it. And just in faith in him, true faith in him, we can get across that gulf. Where we don't have to be distanced from the Lord. True hell, in every conceivable conservative theological definition of hell, is going to be that it's absolute separation from the Lord. That sin has caused a separation between you and God. Jesus did everything he did so there has, never has to be any separation. And as Christians, we need to practice that. We need to make a habit of practicing that where we close that distance. We use by faith what he has made for us so we can do that. Let's make a commitment, brothers and sisters, of spending more time with the Lord, letting our mind dwell on him. As being Christians, we have chosen to be disciples. Let's be disciples to just be with him first and foremost. And then we can do the things that he wants us to do. And I think all those things are extremely important. They are. I love playing on the worship team, for example. I love having an opportunity to play guitar on the unfit band. It, it is incredible, but that needs to be a byproduct of my walk with the Lord and not the prime product. Right. The prime product needs to be me just sitting at his feet and listening to his word. And for those of you, if there's anybody listening that has never made that commitment to the Lord, never made that decision, I challenge you, don't wait another hour. Don't wait another second. 
If the Holy Spirit's been knocking on the door of your heart, I pray that he makes the knock louder, more loving, more authoritative, more appealing than ever before. And you will never, I have never talked to a real diehard, died in wool Christian that ever said they would regret one time or for a second getting up and opening the door of their heart and allowing them to come. So think about that. And if you would like, contact the church, contact Pastor Mike. I'm sure that we, there's plenty of people affiliated with this body that would love to talk you through what you need to do to ask them into your heart. So do that. Don't, don't wait. Don't hesitate. In fact, do it right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you and pray. I thank you and praise you for this time. And Lord, I ask that the truth that you, know, that you share with your deep in our hearts. And God, that we just want to be ritualistic automatons. God, that we would be servants of you. We'd be sons servants that long to just to your feet and listen to your word, to serve at your footstool, Lord. To have our focus on you and not on ourselves. Lord, you are deserving. Lord, you are true and honorable and right and holy and lovely and of good repute, of excellence. You are worthy of all praise and glory and honor and power. Lord, I thank you for the ability to have Facebook in this day and age where we can still commune together with one another as a body and have an opportunity to hear the word and to worship and to seek you more effectively, Lord. God, I thank you. Lord, I pray that this whole COVID-19 thing would pass and pass soon and we could be able to come together in fellowship again. And Lord, uh, if you, we would use this time, you would use this time so as to truly appreciate us being able to come together as a body. And that we wouldn't take it for granted, Lord. But God, in the meantime, while it persists, stir us up to be saying sons of saints, servants, daughters that just want to sit at your feet and listen to your word. And to really put our attention on you and to listen to what you would say. God, I pray that every one of us would have places like West Vienna Four Ways in our hearts. And God, I pray for more of those. We're just out of the blue. We're not even expecting the Holy Spirit. You would just speak things into our life that would just radically transform our entire life. Lord, be with those who have not made a decision for you, who have been debating it for a long time. And God, I ask you to bring them all the way through it, all the way forward. Lord, have your way. We humbly ask all this in the everlasting name of Jesus. Amen. And before we close up, we got a couple of announcements that I was asked to make. But don't forget, we had a church has a YouTube channel now. It's Chester FBC. You can, of course, you can watch services still on Facebook. But YouTube offers a lot of great opportunities to think, to see things in a way. Well, I just I tell you what, I love the YouTube experience. Me and my boys, we probably spend hours of weeks on watching videos on YouTube. And what a great way to see what's going on in the church and see the content that's there the worship times and like that. YouTube is just an awesome tool. And we have some giving instructions. Please remember to keep your giving going on to the Lord. God loves a cheerful giver, and don't forget that. We do have a responsibility in our worship to use the mammon or the things of the world that God has provided us for to give back to the investment of the kingdom. Let's not forget that. And give online at chesterfbc.org. Also do it through PayPal now at chesterfbc at yahoo.com. And it uh, looks like we were looking for some donors. We have a go of 55 donors to support, to come online, to come aboard is what we're doing with the ministry right now. And right now we're at 38, 38, some of us. So praise God for those of you out there that, that's heard the call and felt the burden and done this. Praise God. But let's be praying for the others that will come on board with this. And once again, thank you very much for joining with us. God bless you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share what's on my heart from the word of the Lord. And God bless every single one of you to pieces. Not literally, but you get the idea. Thank you.